and Boshu Anishinaabe, hello friends. My name is Elizabeth Cronk Warner and I'm the Dean of the SJ Quinney College of Law. My pronouns are she and hers, and it's really truly my pleasure to welcome you um, to this month's Native American Heritage Month's Dean's Book Review. And today we're discussing The Night Watchman by Louise Erdrich. Um, but as I like to do, and, and is particularly appropriate for November and Native American Heritage Month, I do want to start by acknowledging um, that the University of Utah acknowledges that this land that we're presently on, I come to you today from the Salt Lake Valley, is named for the Ute tribe, is the traditional and ancestral homeland for the Shoshone, Paiute, and Goshute, and Ute tribes. The University of Utah recognizes and respects the enduring relationship that exists between many indigenous peoples and their traditional homelands. We respect the sovereign relationship between tribes, states, and the federal government, and we affirm the University of Utah's commitment to a partnership with Native nations and urban Indian communities through research, education, and community outreach activities. So it seems really appropriate that we should be gathered here today for this important outreach activity to discuss this book and related themes of Indian law. Um, so as I mentioned today, we are discussing Louise Erdrich's book, The Night Watchman, which you may know uh, won the Pulitzer Prize. And um, I think everybody I've chatted with who's read it has really enjoyed it. So if you haven't had a chance to read it yet, I highly recommend it to you. Um, and uh, the book is based on really the extraordinary life of uh, Louise Erdrich's grandfather, who worked as a night watchman and carried the fight against native dispossession from rural North Dakota all the way to Washington, D.C. The book explores themes of love and death with lightness and gravity and really unfolds with this elegant prose, sly humor and depth of feeling that demonstrates Erdrich's master craftsmanship. Um, Professor Skabine and I were talking a little bit about this book and how, as he put it, there's not a wasted word. And in reading evaluations of the book, um, I saw that one evaluator referred to Erdrich as a muscular writing, a writer. And at first that struck me as kind of an odd description. But as I was reading the book, it really does make sense because there's heft and there's weight to kind of every passage and every thought. Um, so the main character is the night watchman at a jewel bearing plant, the first factory located on the Turtle Mountain Reservation in rural North Dakota. He is also a Chippewa council member who is trying to understand the consequences of a new emancipation bill on the floor of the United States Congress. And we'll go more in depth to that. Um, that relates to the termination era um, when the federal government was terminating, and that means a political termination, the relationship between the federal government and tribes. Over 100 tribes had their political relationship with the federal government terminated during this period. And I believe that Professor Professor Skabine is going to go into greater detail in that, into that. The date is 1953, and he and other council members know that the bill isn't about freedom, that Congress is fed up with Indians. The bill is a termination that threatens the rights of Native Americans to their land and their very identity. Um, so how is it that the government can abandon treaties made in good faith um, for as long as the grasses shall grow and the rivers shall run? So certainly kind of the focus of this book is the termination era and the termination bill as it was drafted against the Turtle Mountain Reservation. But as Erdrich has a tendency to do, she weaves in a lot of other themes. Um, so she weaves in themes of um, urbanization, of what happens to uh, Indians when we move to urban communities. Um, she also weaves in some of this discussion of the vulnerability of Native women. Um, and so I'll talk a little bit in my time about the epidemic that is missing, uh, murdered, and Indigenous women and why it is that uh, Native women in the United States are uniquely vulnerable. So we currently have Professor Alex Skabine with us. And so we're gonna go ahead and start with him. Um, he's gonna focus in again on that termination era and what was happening during that era of the United States. Um, and then I'm gonna talk about uh, why the system currently makes native women uniquely vulnerable. We'll each talk for 15 minutes or so. And again, hopefully Dennis will be able to join us. Um, after that time, you'll see at the bottom of your page, there's a Q and A button. So if you click on that Q and A button, 
You can ask a question and don't feel like free or don't feel like you have to wait till we're done with our presentations. You can ask the question at any time and we'll leave 15 to 20 minutes um, at the end of today's presentations um, to answer your questions. Um, so with that, it is my pleasure to, it is my great pleasure to turn it over to my colleague and really my mentor. We were talking before we um, started today's presentation that, that Alex Gabin is really a giant in Indian country. And so it is truly a privilege to get to work with him on a daily basis. I have to say that's one of the best part of my job. Um, and so I'm going to turn it over to Professor Alex Gabine, who's a professor at the SJ Quinney College of Law and is also um, the Quinney Professor of Law. So Professor Scabine. Okay, I'm, I'm now speechless as a result of this introduction. Uh, but um, good morning. And um, I think Elizabeth kind of explained uh, well what the book was about, but in addition to the problems of women and to the problems raised by termination, I think one of the, the, the joy of this book is how she explains the tenacity of Indians to remain on their lands and continue their way of life. So for some of you that read the book, the book is full of, uh, of descriptions of what it means to be an Indian at that time and why it is important, even though those people are dirt poor, for them to stay on that reservation. So there's a lot of stuff about, uh, uh, lang there's a lot of la Chippewa language, but, but there's a lot of, also a lot of stuff about Indian cooking and uh, Indian clothing. And she weaves that into her, her narrative, I think in, in a wonderful way. All right, um, having said that, uh, I'm gonna talk about you know, one of the big theme is termination. And uh, in order to understand termination, I think you have to understand the history of uh, federal policies towards Indians. So I'm just gonna go very quickly. You know, it started out as a treaty relationship, you know, where the, the, it was a government to government relationship. There were treaties between the United States and the tribes. And that was there until around the 1880s. And then around the 1880s, they decided to, uh, the United States decided to abandon uh, the, the treaty relationship and started to try to assimilate Indians into uh, the general population. So what they did, they basically divided all of the tribal land holding into allotments. And they tried to make Indians into farmers. And that policy went in until not for, for about 40 years, until the 1920s. The Indians, it is said, lost about 90 million acres of land as a result of that, because a lot of them, in effect, were not farmers. And, you know, it, it, and as a result, just leased their land or sold it. But then with FDR came what we call the Indian New Deal in 1934 where basically they, they repudiate the uh, uh, allotment policy and they adopted in effect what we call the Indian reorganization era, which is basically, they, organize, they basically said, we're gonna reestablish a government to government with the tribe. We don't think as, uh, allotment was good. And basically they came up with the Indian Organization Act of 1934 that uh, I think, uh, our other speaker was, was going to talk about. But the problem is, is that there was a lot of resentment in 1934 uh, from, in the Congress. So as long as FDR was there, you know, it, it worked through uh, and he passed the Indian Organization Act. It was a major piece of legislation. But starting in the 1940s, people... Uh, you know, no longer, you know, was no longer FDR was, was gone. And then they, they decided that they were going to reverse that Indian Organization Act policy. And so it really started in 1942, where the Congress started having reports about, you know, wow, those Indians are really doing bad. Uh, they're economically bad and uh, bad off. And as a result, we, we have to do something. So, that, so this was in the 1940s. And then in 1953, the Congress finally adopted House Concurrent Resolution 108, which basically 
adopts the termination policy as the official policy of the United States. Uh, but be, and but again, that you know, it was not people didn't really like that. A lot of people didn't like that that uh, termination policy. And really, starting in the late 1950s, people start uh, politicians start, start trying to re- thinking this was a bad idea. So it was kind of a short lived, but really, it was really something from the early 40s to the late 50s. So about 20 years of termination policy. So. What did it do? Well, first, it terminated about 109 Indian tribes, okay? And termination, and basically that affected about 1.3 million acres of Indian land. Termination is a three-step process. Well, first, there was House Concurring Resolution in 1953, and then you have to pass a, uh, a, a, a individual termination law, you know, per tribe. So most tribes that were affected had, you know, a termination act that affected them. Sometimes they, they decided to, like in the Western Oregon Termination Act, they included a huge amount of tribes in that process. I think over 60 tribes were included uh, in the Western Oregon Termination Law. But basically, you, you know, so then you have your individual termination or tribal specific termination law, and then the Secretary of the Interior has to devise a plan on how to implement the, 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 the termination act passed by Congress. So it's a, it's a long process, and then eventually the plan has to be spent, has to be published in the Federal Register. So what did it mean to be terminated? Well, one, there would be no more government-to-government relationship between the tribe and the federal government. So, you know, the, the, the relationship is called a trust relationship, where the federal government holds property in trust for the benefit of the tribe. So that, that's a, a, uh, it's a complicated relationship where basically the, the, the the trustee is the United States and the beneficiary are the Indians or the Indian tribes. So there would be, so the, the, basically the, the tribal assets that are mostly land at that time would then be sold by the United States and under that plan. And then would be, the, the assets then would be transferred to individual Indians, you know, on a per capita basis, uh, or sometimes to a tribal corporation. But the fact is the tribe would no longer be acknowledged as an Indian tribe for the purpose of our political or constitutional system. That doesn't mean the tribe was eliminated. The tribe continued to exist, but they, they no longer had trust assets and they didn't have any relationship with the federal government. Number three, in effect, all the land became taxable by the state. We, and also, you know, state income tax would then be applicable on the former reservations. Number four, the, you know, the, the two agencies in charge of the relations between the tribes and the United States are the Bureau of Indian Affairs within, within the Department of Interior and the Indian Health Service within HHS. And now th- that would mean that those two agencies would transfer all of their you know, services to the state, to, to state uh, departments, so state agencies. So they lost any relationship with the BIA and the IHS. Then number five, ultimately, tribal sovereignty would be affected. So basically, you know, tribes are said to be sovereign or quasi-sovereign over their territory and their people. So that they have, in effect, uh, uh, they have a right of self-government. But after all the land is taken out of trust, then it's no longer Indian country for the purpose of of federal law, which means that ultimately the status jurisdiction over this land was now regular fee land, 
and the federal and, and, and the tribe then do not have any authority. I mean, they, may, they still have some authority over their people, but they don't have what we call Indian country. Indian country is a term of art that basically says Indian reservation and all the lands within Indian reservation or trust allotments, you know, or what we call dependent Indian communities. So, so most, most of it, it's reservation and, and older land within the reservation. Um, and so they lost that, that governmental power. And finally, there was, and I think it's, it's interesting, in the book, Viera, the uh, older sister, in effect, decides to join a program called the BIA Relocation Program. And that was a program where they tried to persuade Indians to leave the reservation and go to an urban setting. And so she decides to take advantage of that program. She leaves, and then of course, you know, she gets in trouble uh, as soon as she reaches the non-Indian cities. And, you know, so the book is really a lot about a search for, from Patrice, her younger sister, to find Vera. And uh, the, this, the problem with this quote unquote relocation is that um, basically they gave them a one way ticket out of the reservation, but then they were left to their own. So, in effect, most Indians that use that relocation program ended up just like Vera did coming back to the reservation because they felt lost and, and isolated. In the, in the urban settings. Let me talk a little bit now about the lasting effect of the termination. So the termination era was ended uh, in the early 60s. Um, and there were, I, think, I think there was an official pro, uh, proclamation by Richard Nixon, of all people, ending termination. But in effect, the, the Kennedy administration had already laid the groundwork for this. But one act that was passed was something we call Public Law 280. So Public Law 280, in passed in 1953, in effect transferred what was before federal criminal jurisdiction to the states. Okay, so the states then became the law enforcement agency for things that happen on the reservation. In addition, public law 280 uh, be, uh, allowed state courts to have judicial jurisdiction for causes of action arising in Indian country. Okay, so that's the only thing that public law 280 more or less did. At the beginning, people thought that public law 280 allowed state regulatory laws to be also, and taxation laws to be applicable uh, on, on Indian country. And it, I mean, public law to lady is not just for terminated tribes. It's most, it mostly affected tribes that were not terminated, but yet became subject to state jurisdiction. And then the fight was about, you know, can we impose state regulatory power over trust land and Indian reservation? And the Supreme Court, eventually said no. Um, Public Law 280 was applicable to six mandatory states, but then other states would have to join in to opt in. So in effect, uh, it was not applicable to all of the United States. Um, So having said about that, I think that's the lasting effect because Public Law 280 is still in effect. What we have, and I, I worked for the Congress uh, in, from uh, 1980 to 1990. And during that time, we started to restore tribes that had been terminated. So ultimately, and I, I think and one of the, 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 the thing I worked on was as a staff member for the House Interior Committee was actually one tribe was in Utah. And, um, but I, I worked for a lot of tribes in Oregon, with, with a lot of tribes in Oregon, to as far restore them to government to government relationship. So there's been a substantial amount of tribes that have been unterminated or have their federal recognition restored. Um, another Supreme Court case, is, case that um, 
that is meaningful in this area is the case dealing with the Menominee tribe of Wisconsin. And um, basically the, the, the state was saying that termination had terminated all of the treaty rights of the tribe. So this went to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court said, no, in effect, the Termination Act does not terminate the treaty rights. It did terminate the federal relationship with the tribe, but it did not terminate their treaty rights. So they could continue to exercise like the mostly hunting and, and fishing rights. Um, this idea, there is something in the book that, that, that caught my attention where Louis Erdrich said, hey, um, you know, this termination law is in violation of our treaties, okay? And the question is, is it? And basically, of course, the Supreme Court said, well, you know, the treaty rights survived. So the question there is, you know, can the federal government terminate tribes and, and abolish Indian property? And the law on this is that the federal government has what we call plenary power, almost full power over Indians in Indian country, but they cannot take away vested property rights. And so the question is, you know, what is a vested property right? Well, a vested property right is like, let's say, oh, the tribal land that was obtained pursuant to a treaty is a vested property right, which means you have to give the tribe fair compensation when you take their land. And, and the Termination Act did not take property uh, without fair compensation, but what it did, and, it, and obviously ended up not taking treaty rights. The question is, it did take something else, right? It did take the government to government relationship. And the, uh, Louise Erdrich does not answer, of, so of course, this question, but she poses it, you know, how can that be not in violation of the treaty. And, you know, and that's, that's a good question. I mean, basically, this goes back to a old decision in the early 1900 called Sandoval that had to deal with the, whether the Pueblos, the Pueblo Indians were an Indian tribe or not. Okay. And, you know, in that decision, the court said, yeah, you know, the, the Pueblo Indians are an Indian tribe uh, for the purpose of, of the constitution and the, the commerce clause. But uh, even though they had their, their, their land was owned in fee, but, but in that decision, they, they had one sentence that said, whether the relationship between the federal government and the tribes exist is one that is totally up to the Congress. In effect, implying that the, you know, kind of implying Congress can terminate that relationship at any time. So here, you know, is it constitutional? You know, I, I wrote an article at one point saying that it, uh, it was not, but that unfortunately that is not the law uh, in the Supreme Court. One of the things though that uh, is, is the law now is the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indian Tribes. Uh, this is a, for short, UNDRIP, and it was passed in, by, by the UN in 2007. At the time, there was four countries that had heavy Indian populations, including the United States, that voted against. So that's 2007. Eventually, the, during the Obama administration, they, we agreed to this, this UN declaration on the right of indigenous people. So it's applicable to us. And without going into a long detail about what this, this declaration does, I am pretty sure that legally speaking, Termination Act today would be illegal under that UN declaration. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Skabeen. That was wonderful. And I forgot in my introduction um, to mention that Professor Skabeen is a citizen of the Osage Nation. Um, and I'm a citizen of the Sault Ste. Marie tribe of Chippewa uh, Indians. So uh, we have at least two tribal members uh, sharing perspectives today.
So I'm excited to pick up uh, where Professor Skabeen left off. And we have a question in the question and answer that says, be sure to discuss our Utah Senator's role in the book. Um, so I will go ahead and start off with that and then um, discuss a little bit about the unique vulnerabilities of Native women in particular and how that intersects with the book. So I believe the question refers to the role of Ar Arthur Watkins. So Arthur Watkins was a senator from Utah and was very much involved in the termination era um, and was involved with the committee making recommendations as to which tribes to terminate. And you see in the book that um, because him and the main character, Senator Watkins and the main character, Thomas have this kind of back and forth. And I think that back and forth really exemplifies the thoughts um, that many in Congress had at the time that were supporting termination. And you really see two things exemplified in those exchanges between the main character and Senator Watkins in the book. And the first is this idea of um, we no longer want tribes to be beholden to the federal government and to rely on the federal government to support them, kind of this idea of pull yourself up by your bootstraps and become self-sufficient. And as Professor Skabeen explained, um, one that's not quite right because there were treaties, right? That um, in exchange for uh, lands and land successions, tribes had um, negotiated certain rights and responsibilities from the federal government. So that stereotype that tribes are um, unfairly reliant on the federal government, I would certainly say is not an appropriate stereotype given that that was a negotiated for exchange. The other thing that was going on at this time period, as Professor Skabeen explained, termination is happening in the late 40s through the 50s. And if you'll recall from our time period of the country, that's of course post-World War II time period. And it's also the era of McCarthyism. And so there was very much this idea um, amongst many members of Congress that anything that looked like communism was bad uh, within this particular time period. And so the idea of reservations, of communes, and people living collectively as a group rather than individuals smacked to many as communism. And so you'll see in the record, the historical records of that time, that there were some members of Congress that were deeply concerned um, that reservations were kind of separate enclaves, separate communist enclaves within the United States. And so there was that political concern as well. So you see this back and forth between the main character, Thomas, and Senator um, Watkins uh, about, about those themes of the tribal members being lazy, reliant on the federal government, um, and also kind of implicit in all of this are these concerns around communism at the time. Now, what the tribe does which was brilliant for its time. So again, um, this is the Turtle Mountain tribe. And so it's, it's historical fiction because it's based on Louise Erdrich's grandfather. What they did was really a smart argument. So rather than relying on perhaps the legal arguments that Professor Skabeen is absolutely right, were correct in terms of the treaty um, and what Congress could and couldn't do with regards to the treaty, instead of making that argument, many tribes, um, were uh, made the argument, successfully made the argument as did Turtle Mountain to avoid termination, that if they were terminated, then those costs to support the community would be transferred from the federal government to the state and to the counties. And so what they did that was really smart, and, and um, there's a lot in the book about the main character, Thomas, writing letters. He's always writing letters. And that's what he does because he's the night watchman. And so he has to stay up all night. And one of the things that he does to help himself stay up at night is he writes letters. Um, and so he, he writes letters to all the state and the county um, officials asking for their support and saying, hey, look, if we're terminated, you know, the federal government's not giving you this money, you'll now have to support us. And so one of the ways that they were really successful in um, blocking termination is making an argument to their state and county partners that this was not in, in the state and the county's best interest, um, because then they would have to take on the costs when the federal government terminated that relationship. So really kind of a smart, politically savvy 
um, argument. Also, the other way that they avoided termination is um, by bringing in some scholars to help demonstrate that the tribal community was actually a lot poorer than Congress thought it was. And so they were not capable of kind of standing up by themselves. And so the, the book talks about how that, like on the one hand, there's this passage in the book where the main character says that they're both happy and really sad to have this report, happy because it helps in their efforts with Congress, but sad because it demonstrates that their community is very poor. Um, so that's kind of the role that Arthur Watkins plays in the book and the role that he um, played in general. And uh, Mary Ellen Sloan added into the comments that says that I believe the Utah Paiutes were the first bands to be terminated because Watkins needed to have the tribe a tribe terminated in his state, which is a, an interesting um, addition to the conversation. So yes, uh, the state of Utah and Senator Watkins definitely plays a role, a very interesting role in this book. But now I wanted to shift a little bit to the discussion of Native women and why we have a tendency to be uniquely vulnerable both to uh, murder and to sexual assault. So this is a theme that we see throughout the book along with termination. And this really relates to um, Vera. So Vera is the sister of Pixie or Patrice as she likes to be called. Um, and like Professor Skabeen said, Vera and her boyfriend, left the reservation and went to Minneapolis. And it was um, not a successful transfer. And we read, although the book doesn't necessarily focus on it. And if you're interested in this issue, I encourage you to read Louise Erdrich's book, The Roundhouse, because she very much focuses on why the legal system makes Native women uniquely vulnerable in the roundhouse. And, and this theme is kind of more of a background theme in this book, The Night Watchman. But so Vera goes to Minneapolis. Things don't go well with the boyfriend. Something happens with the boyfriend. He disappears. She has a baby and then she starts to be exploited. So we're not explicitly told what happens in Minneapolis, but it's pretty clear that it's not pleasant and she's being sexually exploited. And then at one point, um, it sounds like she's put on a ship because um, so this is around the Great Lakes. Uh, so there are a lot of freighters and shipping um, in the Great Lakes. And this is something that still happens today. So this is not just in our history, but it is not uncommon for native uh, women to be kidnapped and to be put on freighters in the Great Lakes and to be repeatedly raped while they are on the freighters. Um, this is a problem with sex trafficking. Um, it's something that I've personally looked at in my careers because I'm from Michigan and so I'm from the Great Lakes. And so this is something that's still happening today. And so you see that this happens to Vera. She ends up um, being raped repeatedly. Uh, and um, then at, at some point, it gets free and then she's really fortunate because she found she finds somebody who gives her some space to recover. And then at the end of the book, she eventually makes it back to her reservation and and is able to kind of have the space and the grace to start to heal from this intense sexual and emotional trauma that she faced. Um, so this is not hyperbole. This is not Louise Erdrich making something up. Um, this reality for a Native women being uniquely vulnerable is certainly true. And I have here some statistics from the Urban Indian Health Institute that surveyed 71 U.S. cities. And um, the, what they found is that Native American women make up a significant portion of missing and murdered cases in those cities. And not only is the murder rate 10 times higher than the national average for women living on reservations, but the murder rate is the third leading cause of death for Native women. Um, this is really startling as Native people only make up 2% of our U.S. population. Uh, so that really art articulates it. And then Professor Sarah, Sarah Deer, who's an expert in this field, um, she works at the University of Kansas, estimates that a conservative number of Native women who are um, victims of sexual assault is 50%. Some believe that it's actually higher than that. So anytime I'm talking to a group in Indian country, I have to remember that half of the women in the audience could have been survivors or victims of sexual assault. So these numbers are appalling um, and overwhelming. And so why is that? So let's just talk a little bit. We don't have time to go into the nuances and in depth as to why Native women are uniquely vulnerable in our country, but I can at least give you an introduction to that. 
So first you have to look at the vulnerabilities both within the urban communities and on the reservation. And I think Professor Skabeen did a great job of talking about why natives are uniquely vulnerable in urban uh, communities and why those relocation programs did not succeed. The only thing I'll add on to his discussion of urban communities is that the stereotypes about us, about natives, um, are incredibly detrimental in this space. So there are um, stereotypes that we are lazy, that we are drug addicts, and that we are alcoholics, and that we only survive by the good graces of the federal government. And so when we're talking about women who go missing or women who are exploited or women who are victimized, these stereotypes really cut against us because as a result, a lot of Native individuals can't get help when Native women go missing because we're seen to be lazy and drug addicts and alcoholics. Um, I once had a person I was chatting with say to me, oh, all Indians are alcoholics. And, And somebody pointed out to this individual that I was Indian and he turned to me without missing a beat and he said, oh, well, so you know, you know. I just thought, wow, these stereotypes are so um, pervasive that even when confronted um, with it, you're you're just going to double down. So that's just one example of just how embedded these stereotypes are. And they they really do not help us um, get uh, help and assistance in this space. Um, And then, so that's really urban communities. And then you also, of course, have reservation communities. And I think it's helpful to understand um, the criminal jurisdictional scheme that exists in reservational um, communities. So uh, as Professor Skabee mentioned, uh, reservations have unique laws that are applicable, and that is certainly true in the criminal law space as it is in other spaces as well. And I just want to mention two things in particular that I think have really handicapped tribes in terms of effective criminal um, jurisdictional authority. And it's so bad that there are numerous stories of smart criminals who deliberately target Indian country because they know that their likelihood of getting away with it because of these problematic criminal jurisdictional scheme is greater. So for example, several stories of rapists in Oklahoma, because Oklahoma is particularly checkerboarded in terms of what is Indian country and what isn't, um, rapists selecting a native victim and driving that victim around so that she can't say, and it usually is women who are targeted, although not exclusively women. um, So she can't say where she is, um, where she's being abused. um, And so therefore there's real prosecution concerns. So we, there are numerous, numerous story upon story upon story of criminals targeting Indian country, targeting native women because of the jurisdictional problems. So let's talk about these two issues. The first thing I wanna mention is the Indian Civil Rights Act from 1968. Sounds good, right? Indian Civil Rights Act must be a good thing. But what the Indian Civil Rights Act does that is really problematic in terms of the ability of tribes to enforce criminal jurisdiction with their territory is that it limits tribal prosecution to one year and or um, a certain set number of fine. Now, in some instances under the Tribal Law and Order Act, you can toll that. So that could be increased to three years and or a larger fine, but still a significant limitation. And if you are a criminal thinking of, hmm, where should I commit my crime? Um, The fact that tribal courts have been so limited um, is something that's definitely going to come into play. And you may ask yourself, why is it? Why is it that the Indian Civil Rights Act limits tribal court authority in this way? Well, the um, Indian Civil Rights Act applies many of the protections of the uh, U.S. Constitution amendments because interesting side fact, the U.S. Constitutional amendments do not apply to Indian country. Um, And so it applies many of the protections, but it does not include the right to an attorney because at the time there was a lot of concern about whether or not tribes would be able to um, provide attorneys. So as you may know, a felony is uh, equal to uh, the possibility of one year or more in prison. So the way that Congress balanced this is that, okay, well, we're not going to have this right to an attorney, but basically you can't have enforcement authority equal to a felony. So that's kind of how Congress balanced that. And as a result, it's had profoundly negative implications on the abilities of tribes to successfully represent themselves or, excuse me, successfully um, balance criminal jurisdiction. 
The other case I want to mention is the 1978 decision from the U.S. Supreme Court um, of Oliphant. And this case is really important because uh, this case involved um, uh, some claims where the tribe was trying to prosecute non-Indians for crimes that they committed in Indian country. An interesting side note, these are not... um, crazy crimes that are only crimes in Indian country. These were things um, like assaulting a police officer. So things that you know are generally crimes in most countries. Um, but the question was what in front of the US Supreme Court was whether or not the tribe had jurisdictional authority over non-Indians. And ultimately the court in that case held that tribes did not have jurisdictional, criminal jurisdictional authority over non-Indians, that tribes have been implicitly divested um, of that criminal jurisdictional authority, which is really interesting because up until that point, um, the rule had been that Congress had to explicitly divest under that plenary authority that Professor Skabee mentioned, had to explicitly divest tribes of their authority. So this was really a dramatic change um, in the in the uh, Indian law in general, um, and then certainly criminal law. And then that got expanded in the early 1980s to um, civil jurisdiction, implicit divestiture we saw in the Montana line of cases from the early 1980s. So it was later expanded to the civil jurisdictional um, scheme. So these two things in particular, and there are numerous other aspects of criminal um, jurisdictional law within Indian country that have really combined to make it very difficult to have enforcement, Um, but those two in particular. Also, because of the Major Crimes Act, so the federal government has concurrent jurisdiction with tribes over major crimes. So things like homicide, um, felonies committed with uh, weapons, uh, rape, kidnapping, um, the federal government has concurrent jurisdiction. And the reality is that tribes will oftentimes defer to the federal government um, to prosecute. But if you think about it, federal officials could be very, very far away from Indian country. Um, so for example, uh, you could have a tri- or you could have uh, federal marshals who might have to go investigate a rape be upwards of five to eight hours away from Indian country. And in a crime like rape, which is really time sensitive, um, that could be incredibly difficult to get adequate adequate information and evidence in order to prosecute those cases. So that only intensifies and makes prosecution of these cases that much difficult. So all of this really combines um, to create a jurisdictional nightmare in terms of criminal enforcement in Indian country um, that uh, really makes it difficult to enforce crimes. And as a result, we know that uh, Native women have a tendency to be uh, greatly victimized and survivors of sexual assault, rape, and murder, um, and also uh, uniquely vulnerable um, to these types of criminals, and that we know that criminals are deliberately um, attacking and and, uh, going after Indian country and Native women. So really um, a a sad, sad is not even, it's not even strong, it's a tragedy for our country that this is going on. And and, uh, Louise Erdrich definitely explores this um, in her book. And as I mentioned, if you're interested in learning more, um, I encourage you to read her other book, The Roundhouse, um, that really dives into this topic and and explores those uh, jurisdictional problems. So we have now about 14 minutes and I'm happy to uh, open it up to questions. If anybody has uh, questions or other comments that they want to make. The one other theme that I just want to point out is there's some mention in the book of um, of, uh, of Indian boarding schools because there's a character, he's a ghost, but he's a character of Roderick who died as a result of um, being in an Indian boarding school which as you know, is now something that's come to light. This is something that in Indian country we've known for a long time, um, that many people died in boarding schools or died in the process of trying to escape from boarding schools. Um, And so if you're interested in learning more, I definitely encourage you. There's uh, numerous documentaries out about the boarding school experience in the United States in general. Um, There's also been stories about our experience here in Utah. Um, And so that's also a theme that I want to acknowledge that is in the book.
Um, so we have a question and I'll invite Professor Skabeen to come back on camera that says, in recent years, I have volunteered in Navajo and have been told that the term Indian is disfavored by the Native American community. Should we still be saying Indian law, Indian country, et cetera? Professor Skabeen, you want to start with that one? Well, you know, this, this goes back to uh, the 19th, I think in the 1970s, people uh, start making a distinction and the Indians were always divided. I think that most reservation Indians call themselves Indians. A lot of the urban Indians start calling themselves Native American. And, you know, you have this dichotomy for some, you know, our, our national organization that is visibly still the National Congress of American Indians. But yet when, the, I think one of the, the most famous law firm of Indian rights was established, they decide to call themselves the Native American Fund, you know, NARF, the Native American Rights Fund. So this, there's been this dichotomy, um, you know, I, and uh, so, the, the, you know, the, the question is, you know, does it, really, does it really matter to some population? And if it does, then we should, we should do whatever the people that feel strong about this, uh, I think, if it, they find it offensive. But I don't know yet uh, if um, if there is a consensus among among the, the in, I mean among the Indian population uh, about this. You, yeah. you, know, you know that Dennis Eckes is, is on there. I see. Yes. Um, and then I'll just I'll just join in, and then I and, and then if Dennis has anything to add, I, I welcome him to join us as well. Um, I'll just add, so for, for me speaking personally, of course, in a perfect world, we would all refer to um, individuals by the tribe that they're affiliated with. Um, but for me, I use the term Indian because my tribe is the Sault Ste. Marie tribe of Indians. That is our official name. Um, and so for me, it's, it's the name of my tribe. Um, and then also Indian country, because that, that was specifically a question as well. That is a legal term of art, as um, Professor Skabeen explained, that is defined um, within the U.S. code. And so when we use that term, we tend to use it um, from the legal perspective. So rightly or wrongly, it is, um, it is defined in the U.S. code. And I want to welcome... Um, Dennis Ickes, who uh, apologies, we had a little bit of confusion about when the when today's session started. But uh, Dennis, I don't think you. I wonder if you have anything to add. Well, the only thing I would add, <clears throat> I would look to you to to be the more authoritative on it. But I, I'll relate to you what was told to me by Wendell Chino, who was the chairman of the Mescalero Apache, many years ago, <clears throat> and he, that same question was asked of him, and he says, I use the term Indian because it's in the constitution and it's the constitution that protects us. And therefore he chose to go by that term. And um, much like yourself, uh, it's in the name of your, in your constitution. Well, this is in the United States constitution. And I think that that was a good answer from him. And this is definitely a hot topic. I know, um... Like, for example, some tribes like the term tribe, some tribes don't. They prefer First Nations or um, nation. So I think in general, keeping an open mind and if that usually if somebody has a strong opinion, they'll correct you. And Professor Sabine, ask Sabine, I see, I think you were about to say something. No, I mean, one other thing I was going to say uh, uh, that the termination era did is that it was a call to arms to Indians or Native Americans, if they were living in the cities, that were that were not politically engaged before. So she describes, you know, Thomas uh, and uh, Thomas, and it's, I, I love that term, the night watchman, because in effect, what he is 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 watching for his tribe during those dark days. But I think a lot of people got um, became activists as a result of the Termination Act. So by the 1960s, you know, you had a, a lot of leaders like Wendell Chino that were aware that uh, they needed to, to, uh, to be vigilant. And uh, the only thing I remember about Wendell Chino is that he was very leery that the Termination Act was gonna come back in another form. 
So when we passed the Indian Self Determination Act, he said, "Well, I want. I'm very. I'm, I hope this does not turn into the Indian Self Termination Act." <laughs> you know. So he was he was very leery that somehow this thing was going to come back. But but in effect, it, it didn't come back. And uh, and uh, but a, a lot of Indians, you know, like so for instance. Even when I when I was in Congress, uh, when I was working for the Congress uh, in the 1980s, you know, if if you start talking about, well, you know, I think we should change the trust relationship. A lot of those old timers who says don't do anything because they're all the alternative was if if there's no trust relationship and if you don't like the exact way it works, then the alternative is termination. So they they were they were protective of of that relationship. That is great insight from your time in Congress. Um, Virginia Lee asks, to what extent, if any, does the current effort to divide and conquer non-white persons derive from the U.S. government's Indian termination efforts? Alex, Dennis, any thoughts on that? Alex, it's you. <laughs> no, no, I mean, no, uh, the question is, the policy to divide non-white person yeah, I think so. You know, there's been lots of criticisms of the federal government recently. Does any of it have its origins and in, in kind of the termination era? Well, I mean, you know, one of the unfortunate termination act. I, I mean, I think it was unfortunate was this, which is unique, is the Youth Termination Act, and the Youth Termination Act in effect divided the tribe between the full blood youths and the mixed blood youths. And then it terminated all the mixed blood youths. And that seems to, you know, in effect, create a, a problem or, you know, to divide and conquer between the full blood bloods and the mixed blood. I'm not a, 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 an historian that specializes in the youths, but I believe that as it's true in, in all cases, in all tribes, this term full blood is not really a genetic uh, uh, this uh, description. It's really, uh, you know, it's something else. And uh, we, we saw that uh, when, when we were trying to settle, you know, the, the Black Hills claim there was a full blood party. And yet this, this guy comes into to our office on Capitol Hill. And, you know, he says, well, I'm a full blood. And here he is, red hair. <laughs> I thought, well, there's, there's some kind of Irish guy in him somewhere, but but the fact is, it, it I think it's a politic. A lot of times, it's a political uh, distinction about how you think, and so I I suspect that not all of the full blood youths were real full blood, and I think some of those mixed blood youths may have may have been full blood, but there was other reasons. This was a, I mean, but there was definitely an idea with the BIA to try to split the tribe. I mean, with my tribe, the, the Osage Indian nation of Oklahoma, there was a time where, because the, the law were applicable to full blood differently than to mixed blood. You know, so for instance, full bloods were deemed to be incompetent. You know, mixed blood could petition for a degree of a certificate of competency much earlier on. So eventually, as a result of that, on the at, at that time, you know, like, like the 1920s, they, they became a there was a quote unquote full blood party, you know, like you have a Republican party, and there was a mixed blood party, and that was the, the quintessential division in the tribe. So, and but I think that was brought in by by the United States because tribes didn't make distinctions like this before. Like in in my tribe, you know, when I, I researched the old documents. Basically, you were a, a citizen of the of the Osage Nation if you lived with them, and they and they and they adopted you, and so you could marry into the tribe if you if you were a white guy. That's for sure. But if you left the Osage Nation, then they basically would say you're no longer a citizen. So basically, some of those Osages, let's say, that would go to Washington when they came back, they would have to petition. To become Indian again to the to the tribal council, so that's more like how the tribe operated than to basically come up with your one quarter, your full blood, your half, and stuff like this. Uh, I can make one more observation, and not so much in, on uh, mixed bloods and full bloods, but 
uh, on observations of minorities in general. It's been my experience over many years that the uh, U.S. Civil Rights Commission and uh, some other minority organizations really make a distinction between those who are Indian or Native American as compared to other minorities. They see uh, and perhaps don't have the same level of empathy for Indian issues that they do for other minority issues because they feel like Native Americans, Indians have uh, their own advocacy, they have their own a set of rules and laws that are unique to them. And so they don't have quite, at least in my experience, the same feeling to, towards them as they do towards Hispanics, Latinos, uh, um, uh, African-Americans and other minorities. So um, I, I found that to be the case. Well, wonderful. So unfortunately, we are out of time. Um, I know, speaking for myself, I could listen to Alex and Dennis all day um, and keep going, but we did want to keep this to an hour. Um, so thank you so much for joining us for today's conversation. Again, if you haven't done so already, definitely recommend The Night Watchman to you. Um, we're going to take a little bit of break on the Dean's book review. So we will uh, not have a book review in December, but we'll be back with two books in January. So for Martin Luther King Day, we'll be reading Nice Racism, um, the newest book by Robin DiAngelo. Um, and then we will also be talking about non-binary genders. Um, so please join us uh, for uh, renewed discussions in January. In the meantime, I hope everybody has a wonderful Thanksgiving and holiday season. Thanks so much, Che McGwitch.